Okay. Kids, you're dismissed. I'm just going to put something up here. So what we're, what we're doing is we're going through the Gospel of Matthew, and we're in Season 3, which is uh, Chapters 8 to 10. And we're going to go through them pretty quick. And uh, we've been seeing a pattern here where there's usually three miracle stories followed by a teaching story. And we're going to look at the second section of three miracle stories in a row. We're not going to get to the teaching today. But I think uh, what uh, I want us to think about is that we sometimes, when we connect with Scripture, we connect just in our heads. We connect cognitively, but God also wants us to connect emotionally uh, with our hearts as well. These miracle stories in, in our, in, in, that we're looking at are meant to grab us and really shake us into reality. And so when we read the Bible, it's a good strategy to read the Bible and to become emotionally invested in it. And sometimes we watch a movie, we're watching uh, a movie at home, and we're eating popcorn, and we're like, oh, cool, this movie's scary, or it's interesting, or it's emotional, but when it's done, I can turn it off, and then it's over. And I think the Bible's encouraging us to enter into the story as if it's our story, and to become invested in it. Not to keep it at a safe distance where we can sterilize, look at it, but allow it to transform our hearts by, by getting involved with how the characters would have felt. When we read the Bible that way, we learn through the feelings that we have when we read it. And so that's exactly what we're going to do today. I've done this before, and uh, I don't know if everybody is, is, has been here for this, but what I'm going to do is it's called a first-person narrative, and I'm going to um, tell these stories as if I am Matthew, the person who wrote this whole thing in the beginning. And I'm going to explain why, how that all works. And I think it's good for us to intentionally understand that Matthew puts these stories together. If you look at Luke or Mark, these stories aren't necessarily in this order. And it's for a very specific reason that, that um, Jesus did these things in Matthew. It records it this way. So let's get started here. Jesus was tired, and I could, I could see that clearly. As the boat moved away, I could see him in the back of the boat, getting cuddly and, and putting the cloak around him and starting to fall asleep. He tucked himself in, and I could just see the shepherd's heart that he was spent. He was worn out. He was tired from healing all those people. And so he fell asleep, and we, we focused on our paddling, and we, we were moving across the lake, and we were past halfway uh, when the huge darkness started to descend upon the lake. And it wasn't just that there was clouds coming, there was something else too. There was these powerful, big, black, stormy clouds moving down upon all of us. And it was too far to turn back now. And I could see the nervousness in my friends' faces. And maybe if we kept paddling hard enough, we could maybe get to shore, or even to the shallow end, where there aren't seven or eight foot waves that can turn our whole boat upside down and completely capsize us. I looked at the back of the boat where Jesus lay sleeping and the rain was starting to come down hard and it was even on his face, but it didn't seem to disturb him at all. He was even kind of smiling as he was sleeping and I, I remember being agitated. I was, I was nervous and I was almost a little bit envious that he wasn't at all experiencing what we were experiencing. But we kept paddling harder and we were yelling at each other over the thunder and the crashing water. We were being tossed back and forth by these tall, strong, proud waves. And the boat itself was starting to take on water. And we weren't nervous anymore. We were terrified. And, and Peter and John had been on this lake fishing through types of storms, but nothing like this. These are the storms that you sometimes could see coming and you could get back to shore in time. These are the types of storms that killed fishermen. The type of fishermen that were stupid enough to be on the water like this. And nobody was paddling anymore. We were just sitting there like scared cats, wide-eyed, drenched, and white-knuckling the edges of the boat. Probably could go here to this story. That would probably be a, just give you guys a visual. Peter carefully crawled back to Jesus and started to shake him wildly, and Jesus' wet face instantly changed. He woke up confused as Peter was shaking him restlessly. Lord, save us. We're all going to die. Peter yelled face to face. And Jesus calmly put his hands on Peter's terrified, shaking body, and he forced him to stop. 
He was looking at him intensely, and, and Peter knew the Lord had a plan. And so Jesus spoke loudly over the storm to, to all of us. You of little faith, why are you so afraid? I remember being so confused by that question. I mean, we were terrified, weren't you, Jesus? Look around. And then with one arm, he, he gently pushed Peter to the side, and he stood up, and he started to walk toward the middle of the boat. And we were all yelling at him, what are you doing? Sit down, you're going to fall out of the boat. And he looked at us, and then he looked past us with an intensity in his eyes, and he looked directly into the storm. Silence, be still, he commanded. And I can remember the next moment so well, because it is burned on all of our memories. The lightning stopped immediately. In fact, the storm clouds began to move away so fast from the lake that I didn't even feel like they were even there. And the boat started to uh, simmer down really fast, really quickly. And then the next thing you know, it looked like as if it was just pure glass. And the moon was overhead and everything was calm. And there we were, 12 men in a boat with Jesus sitting in this boat, dripping wet and terrified, and none of us said anything because we were all thinking the exact same thing. What type of human being is this? First the miracles with the simple word, and now even the storms obey his voice? We were terrified, but not of the storm. Who was this man in the boat with us? And we were relieved to see the shore, and we paddled toward it, grateful just to be alive. And when we reached the shore, all of us climbed out of the boat to rest, because we were exhausted from the stress. We were experiencing shock. The sun was just about to rise, and we could see the gray light everywhere. There was a fog up in the hills, and, and we knew there were tombs up there. It was supposedly, it was a haunted graveyard. I tried not to think about it, but I, I couldn't stop. There was, there was this rumor of two men who had thousands of demons living in them. So powerful that, that nothing could keep them bound. They had broken chains, they had scared off all the crowds, all the townspeople, and supposedly they lived up there in those hills. It's a good thing that this was only a ghost story. We had a fire going and we were cooking some food and we were just getting ready to go to sleep. It's just simply too much for one day. And then I saw it. James looked like he had just seen a ghost and he was holding his hands closely to his body and he was slowly backing up toward the boat. We were looking at him and he didn't say anything. He was utterly terrified what was going on. And then we heard it. The loud, high-pitched screaming, the raspel, raspy, painful sound of men yelling. We turned and could see through the fog two men weaving their way in and out of the graves, quickly approaching our group. The ghost story was true. And then Jesus' face became intense again, like on the boat, and he started to walk toward them. And as they got closer, we could hear the snarling and the wheezing, the fury and the fear coming from these two men. They both had chains on their wrists and ankles, but the links had been broken, their hair was matted, they had ripped clothes and cuts all over their bodies, and their eyes were wide and wild. And they stopped within ten feet of Jesus, and the most startling thing happened. They both bowed down on their knees before him, and we heard what, we, what sounded like thousands of voices, like a giant crowd of men all yelling at the same time. What do you want with us, Son of God? Have you come here to torture us before the appointed time? And although I was terrified, I could see that Jesus was fully in control of the entire situation. The men were laying down before him and foaming in the mouth and agonizing screams, and it was terrifying, but Jesus was in control. 
And then he spoke again in a voice that sounded like a a crowd of people through a microphone. Over a loudspeaker, these these thousands of voices at once. If you drive us out, send us into the herd of pigs on the hillside over there. And they remained silent now, pleading through the bodies of their hosts. Their fate was fully in Jesus' hands. Jesus waited, and then suddenly with a loud, a voice louder than the storm, with a voice louder than the thousands of demons at his feet, he commanded with one word, Go! And the men shrieked and convulsed, and instantly the entire herd of pigs on the hill began to shake and scream as well. Thousands of pigs descended down in onto the shore, onto the beach, shrieking and stampeding, and the ground was shaking all around us. And the pigs didn't stop. They kept pushing on, and, and they, were, they, were, they were screaming, and they were getting angry and fierce, and then they were scared, and they moved all the way into the water until they were gone. And the water became calm once again. And there were half a dozen shepherds up on the hillside, and they saw the entire thing. And we were looking at them as they were running off to the village. They'd be back, most likely with crowds. And again, all of us disciples simply stood there staring at Jesus as he calmly walked over to the two men who were lying on the beach, lying in the sand, crying. And he touched them and brought them up to himself, and we could hear him talking with them quietly and comforting them. And all we could do was stand there in fear. Who was this Jesus? Who could he be? What authority did he possess? And even though we were tired, we couldn't sleep. We were in shock, and I was running through the entire event in my head. The loud noises, the thousands of pigs, the two men sitting over there in their right minds. But mostly, I was thinking about what the demons had said to Jesus. They called him God's own son. They said that he was appointed at a time to torture them. Thousands of fallen angels. And Jesus was above them too, just like the storm. Jesus was their judge. Jesus was their conqueror sent to destroy them. Who was this Jesus? We trusted Jesus, but we were all terrified of him now. He was exactly the same as us. He was a human. He needed food and he needed sleep, but he was also something more. And it was eerie and terrifying and yet somehow reassuring. He came back and he talked with us and you could tell, he could tell that we were scared of him. But it was so different because he still laughed and ate food alongside of us, but he was just so much more than we had thought he was. He was one of us, and yet he wasn't. Who is this man? And then I remember the crowds coming from the town, running down that same hill as the pigs did toward us and toward Jesus. The shepherds were in the front, and the town elders were right behind. Instead of thousands of pigs, now there were thousands of people all surrounding our group. And they were talking loudly, and they were pointing at the two men, and someone had brought a key in it and locked the chains from the men. And the family members of these two men were hugging and crying and kissing and rejoicing. But there was another feeling, too. There was a great fear. The two town elder, or the town elders bowed down before Jesus, and they begged him to leave this area. And Jesus looked sad. I think Jesus wanted to share the good news of the kingdom with them. He wanted to release them and heal them as well. But they were terrified. And there also seemed to be some sort of resentment and anger at the people who owned the pigs, that they were now gone. There were mixed feelings throughout the crowd as we gathered ourselves and climbed back into the boat. The two men wanted to come with us, but Jesus told them to stay behind and to tell the good news to whoever would hear and listen to these things. As we crossed over the lake, there was utter silence. We had a few hours to process everything that we had seen. This was something new for us. We could never go back to the way that we used to view Jesus. 
And Jesus just looked at us and he smiled. He knew what was going on inside of every one of us. It's hard to explain how you can love somebody so much and be loyal to them and desire to go wherever they go and yet at the same time be completely terrified in their presence. Jesus was gentle with us and he seemed to understand us and comforted us, but it was also absolutely terrifying in a good way. And Jesus directed us to take the boat back to Capernaum, his hometown where he had healed Peter's mother, where he had um, helped out the centurion, where all these people had been healed. And I could see the look on Jesus' face of the sadness of all those precious people across the lake who had rejected his saving power. But hopefully, these people on this side would get it. As soon as we hit the, the, the shore, crowds immediately gathered and followed us as we walked through the town. Inside of the house, a man was brought forward on mat by his friends. And Jesus' face lit up, and he was smiling again. And he said to him, Take heart, my son. Your sins are forgiven. And Jesus was excited. And the man on the mat looked surprised, and, and instantly everybody in the crowd was as well. And there was a hush speaking all throughout the crowd. People looked angry, and other people looked concerned and confused. What did Jesus just say about forgiveness of sins? Who is this? And us 12 disciples were still in shock from the storm and the demons. And I remember thinking in my head, man, if only you people had seen what we have just seen. You would not dare to ask any questions of this man. You'd be terrified to even think those thoughts. Is there anything that he cannot do? Is there anything that is above his authority? And Jesus' face changed and we could again see that sadness come into his eyes. He looked at the teachers of the law, the leaders of these people with that same intensity that he looked at the storm and, the, and with the same intensity looked at the men with demons, but there was also a compassion in his voice as if he was inviting them into something. Why do you entertain evil thoughts in your head, in your hearts? Which is easier to say, your sins are forgiven or to say get up and walk? But I want you to know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. And so he said to the paralyzed man, in a way that would help verify and validate that he was who he says he was, get up and take your mat and go home. And the men's four friends all moved out of the way, and instantly they, they, we could see the man was fully fixed on Jesus. And he began to stand, and then he began to walk forward, and the crowd was completely silent. There were hundreds of people, and you could just hear the heavy breathing and the anticipation. I looked at the crowd, and I saw the same emotion that I had been feeling. They had fear in their eyes, too, but it was a different type of fear than the people across the lake. The best type of fear. The type of fear we 12 disciples have been feeling the entire boat ride back to Capernaum. The kind which leads to rejoicing and praising God, just like us disciples, these crowds too. They couldn't explain how any of this is possible, and they just stared at Jesus in wonder. We were absolutely terrified of him, but this is what led us to this great joy. And, and that the crowd started to cheer and to dance and to sing, and my eyes lo locked eyes with Jesus. And I saw that intensity, and I saw that love. How could it be that I was both terrified and fully drawn to this man of power? Maybe that's what happens when you stand in wonder of something this powerful. And as you read the rest of my biography of King Jesus, the, the Gospel of Matthew, you'll see many interactions with him between human beings and himself. What is Jesus' hope in you hearing these stories? Why did Jesus orchestrate all of these events to bring his disciples along for the ride? When you read my gospel account, you've got to look for clues. And so I want us to quickly look at some clues before we get into fear. The Sermon on the Mount, after Jesus had finished speaking, 
I said some things. I said in verse 28 is the narrator. When Jesus had finished saying these things, the crowds were amazed at his teaching because he taught as one who had authority, not as the teachers of the law. That's how the Sermon on the Mount ended. And then right after that, there's a man who came with leprosy, and he looked at Jesus' authority and says, if you're willing, you can make me clean. And then there was a man who came, a centurion, and he said, this is what he said, he said, say the word, and my servant will be healed. For I myself am a man under authority. And then there's a bunch of healings where Jesus just simply spoke, and he healed people with sickness, and he healed people with demons. And then after the storm, us disciples were completely amazed, and we asked, what kind of man is this? Even the wind and the waves obey him. Can you guys see a pattern here? And after that, the demon said, what do you want with us, O Son of God? And there was just this complete understanding of the absolute power and authority of this man. And then the large crowd of people who begged Jesus to leave because they were terrified. And then Jesus declaring that he could do what only God could do. He could forgive sins. And finally, this entire crowd being amazed at Jesus' authority demonstrated undeniably. Can you see what I'm trying to reveal about our king by weaving these stories together? There is a fear of Jesus when he unleashes his power, when he reveals his true identity by overcoming things that are bigger than us. And when he shows himself capable over things that terrify us, our picture of him grows immeasurably. We as creatures can't help it. When he reveals his magnificence, we all will respond. So what I want to do right now is I want to look at three different ways that they responded, that people and those spirits were... Um, responded to Jesus. And I want to talk about how the fear of God, according to the Bible, is different than maybe we've thought. The first type of fear is the fear, the full-on fear and loathing of the demons. That they are the ones, and it's super interesting in our story, they are the only ones in the story who truly have an accurate picture of who Jesus is. Because they're not humans with physical limitations. They can see the spiritual realm. They can see Jesus in all of his glory. And they're terrified. And they're the only ones who accurately speak about him. We have physical limitations as human beings. So we can't see all of Jesus' glory. In the Gospels, he sometimes pulls back the curtain so people can see. The demons can see fully who he is. But that leads them to being afraid of him. And to moving away from him and being repulsed by him. There's a different type of fear that is experienced in these stories. The crowds on the hillsides, as well as the teachers of the law, the religious elite, have the opposite problem from the demons. They don't know enough. They reject Jesus because they don't want to accurately see him as he truly is. The real Jesus doesn't fit into their expectations of what he should be like, what he's capable of, and what our intentions are. Ultimately, they don't feel safe because they don't feel in control. Right? So the first group, they don't want Jesus, the people across the lake, they don't want Jesus to completely upturn their entire cozy, safe, steady, cute little worlds. They're happy with the way things are going, and so they're asking him to leave their area. In their minds, he shouldn't be allowed to interfere, crossing a preconceived safety zone or safety line. We don't want that. You were scared of what you could do, how you could change our lives. He doesn't seem to want to play inside of their rules and boundaries, and so they reject him. But the religious leaders are a little bit different. They control and they censure their picture of what God is like, not because they're scared of him, Anyways, they're not scared of him turning the world upside down yet. Later in the gospel, they are. But they're more afraid uh, that they don't have the control anymore, and their pride and their certainty of what God needs to be like is controlling who they, they want him to be. They already know how God will act, think, and speak, and they cannot control that God in their theology, and they hate that. And the final response the, the one that God wants us to have is the, what, the, what the crowd at the end had, that they were full of amazement and they praised and they rejoiced about God. 
especially the disciples, this inner circle who were experiencing another side of Jesus that was awe-inducing. It was fearful, and yet it led to a great presence and rejoicing and restfulness. Now, I want to say something here that's super counterintuitive, um, but I think it's really helpful because Jesus has what's called an upside-down kingdom. We human beings think that we know how reality ought to work, and Jesus says things throughout the Gospels which are opposite to our intuition. They're opposite to what we think Christianity ought to be like, what reality is like. Here's the spiritual truth. Every creature in the universe has been designed by God to have a fear category. But it looks different than you think it does. Did you guys know that? Fear is not a distortion that came after the fall. Every human being is supposed to have a fear in their life. God designed it this way, but it looks completely different than we think. God designed us to fear him, and these stories are a small example of teaching found up throughout the Bible. But the type of fear that God wants us to have is not a fear uh, of where, where it's unexpected and he's a monster. The type of fear that, that we naturally think of because of sin is we're afraid of things because they're evil or ugly or they're uncontrollable and they lead to destruction. And so it's a preservation tool that's in our minds. This isn't the type of fear that I'm talking about. These are all distortions. We need to make no mistake about this. When people truly meet the living God of the Bible, like if we actually meet the real God of the Bible, we are terrified. Not because he's trying to do anything, but because he's so different than us. And the first thing he always says is, fear not. Don't fear the way that you have been taught to fear. Fear me a different way. So I was reading a commentary on Matthew this week, and they were saying that the energy in a mature hurricane throughout, throughout its entire lifespan is more powerful than all of Russia and United States' nuclear arsenal put together. The amount of energy that's being released into the environment. There's enough power and electrical energy in a hurricane electrically to power the United States for three to four years. I didn't know that. Hurricanes strike fear into people as well as awe. And if I watch a TV show and I see a hurricane, that's, that, that feels like, okay, that's something. That, I, I, I kind of respect that. But if I was in Miami and one of these things was passing through the neighborhood, I would feel completely different. Now, God's not malicious. He's not evil. He doesn't want to terrify us in that way. But we're, when the actual presence of the living God, even the highest angels, stand in awe of God because he's something beautiful to behold. And the good news is that Jesus is for us. He's not against us. And so the fear of, the God, of, of God, according to the Bible, is one of the best kept secrets of the Christian life. And I don't want us to run away from this blessing. It's so counterintuitive, but the Bible promises that this is where life comes from. This is where blessing comes from. And I want to show you guys something after this. Proverbs 14, 26 says, Whoever fears the Lord has a secure fortress, and their children it will be a refuge. And so in our lives, we have lots of fear. And sometimes we cover up our fear, and we don't identify it as fear. Sometimes we get angry with other people, and it comes from fear of controlling the situation or who that person could become. Sometimes we have fear, and that leads to anxiety. It leads to stress. It leads to overanalyzing things and spending way more time than we need to on things that are distractions that don't need to be there. God can take all those things away. That's why he said to them, you have little faith. Why are you afraid? If we have fear of God in the way that God is made, that he is bigger than our lives, he can take away all those things and replace it with assurance and peace and restfulness. But if we do not trust God in this way and we make God small, we put him into a box, when things come into our life, it's just us versus our situation. And that's a scary place to be. And so the fear of God is super critical. Proverbs 19 verse 23 says, The fear of the Lord leads to life. Then one rests content, untouched by trouble. There are people who walk with the Lord, who go through very scary situations, but they know their God. The presence of the living God is among them, and it takes away their fear, because they know him who they ought to fear and revere in awe. It's not a terrifying fear. 
It's a fear that this is the thing that controls all things, and I'm under his control, and he'll protect me. So C.S. Lewis said that um, the Puritans uh, are so misunderstood, and C.S. Lewis said that Satan, one of Satan's biggest tricks is to keep us away from the Puritans. That's what C.S. Lewis said. And the Puritans get a bad reputation of being people who are grumpy, and they want you to be miserable. And if you actually read the Puritans like I am, you see that they, these are counselors. These are shepherds who love your soul, and they want you to be free. This is John Flavel from his book, Triumphing Over Sinful Fear. If we were to understand how dear we are to God, our relationship to him, our value in his eyes, and how he protects us by his faithful promises and gracious presence, we would not tremble at every appearance of danger. There are so many things in our life that don't need to be there that are fear-induced. It's a creature trying to preserve and control their destiny. If we give those up into the almighty hands of God, a peace and a rest can come over our life that we've never experienced before, but it only comes with the fear and the respect and the revere of Christ the King. I'm reading these people. These people are counseling me day after day, month after month, year after year, and I'm turning into these people. These people have just this, this love of God and this supernatural trust. I'm just starting this journey, but I'm inviting you into it too. This is what John Flavel says. I will put my fear in their hearts. They shall not depart from me. That's Jeremiah 32, verse 40. That is a different kind of fear than the one that startles you. God promises to put it in you, not to shake and undermine your assurance, but to guard and to maintain it. Jesus is your shepherd, and if you respect him and understand that he has full control, he can take away these fears that don't need to be there. The real Jesus of the Bible already controls all things. He isn't asking to be your king and to be the king of the world. He already is. Christianity is not about, Christianity, sorry, is about coming into the light and recognizing the reality of the one who controls all things, and he's inviting us to just rest. Jesus wasn't going to let that boat flip upside down. He had a plan to go to the other side. He, they couldn't have done anything, and it would have been okay. Jesus is saying, you have little faith. We don't have to live this way. He fully controls our destiny. Enter into these things. When we submit our lives to Jesus, we learn to fear him with reverence and obedience, and that fear box, that fear category, can be turned and redeemed into what it was meant to be, an adoration and an awe of God that he holds all things in our hands. So ABC, that's something that we need to choose. You, each one of you need to choose. Will I live in the fear of being my own master? And when these things get too big for me, I have to fight them my own, or will we enter fully into submission to this king who controls all things? If we do, we'll be safe, we'll be restful, and peace will come into our life. I want us to just think about these things and understand that Christ has so much more for you. He has so much more for me. I think I want to just end there. and We're not going to do discussion time just because of the AGM coming after. Um, but if, if you want to talk more about this, that there's fear in your life, that there's stress in your life, there's anxiety, sometimes there's fighting going on between relationships. Some of it is fear-driven. Jesus wants to take this away and replace it with trust in him. If I'm speaking to you now, and if you know what I'm saying is true, I just invite you to call out to God and ask him to put this other type of fear in your life. He'll change you forever.